All right, so let's begin with hedge fund uh, strategies. I'm going to be teaching in my way, in my order. So you'll have to follow that because there's a logical sequence the way I do. And I do not follow the way the chapter is given or even the way the number of chapters as in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. I don't like to do that. I like to follow my own order because there is a connection between topics that are terms interrelated. So I like to go about it. So we'll be doing hedge fund strategies right now. So I want you to focus on strategies. Hedge funds terminologies is separately covered. So I, I, I mean, just, just just uh, go with the flow once the entire portion is over you'll be able to you know put together the whole thing properly right so don't worry about that part that is one second uh, I know I'm using different colors this time with different chapters so I use the black background then a white I'm using a gray one so I just want a little feedback I'm just trying to figure out what is less training to your eyes because I know a lot of you guys are studying online and you know so I want to know that when you're studying for long duration and very heavy topics not very heavy I like this topic I mean this is a very enjoyable topic to me hedge fund strategy is really interesting the one we are going to do right now so uh, just just um, um, I'm just trying to take feedback I'm collecting feedback so that I know actually which background is working better which is less training to the eyes more calm and all I think gray is working going to work well that is my personal opinion anyway so let's start with hedge fund strategies we've understood what is hedge funds I'll get into the basic terminologies later but let's see what hedge fund does so first I need to understand what it does then I can get into the technicalities of it so <clears throat> one we have established just to round up one we have established that hedge funds are like rich people's mutual funds what happens when we people invest in mutual funds? We invest small amounts like 500, 1000, 2000 rupees. It's the common public's money that is invested in mutual fund. The government cannot allow that common public's money is used to gamble in the market, take extensive risks, if not gambling, take extensive risks and all. And at times the common public gets fooled by the attraction of very high returns. It is the vulnerable that actually fall for this because they are in the most dire need for money, the most extreme requirement for money. And when people try to sell them those two good, you know, all those scheme, uh, schemes that is get rich quick schemes are all scams. So one has to understand and we see so much that is shown in your movies and all of that. So it never ever works. So now what happens is that the gullible, the vulnerable people ultimate, ultimately fall for it. And we can we have to make sure as a society, as a as finance professionals as well, that these kind of uh, unethical practices are not done. That is the reason why mutual funds are heavily regulated. They are not allowed to do short selling. They cannot borrow shares and sell in the market. They can't use leverage. That means if I have 100 rupees invested in mutual fund, mutual fund can invest only 100. They cannot take a 100 borrowing and invest 200 in the market. They're not allowed to do that. So there is no leveraged investment that mutual funds can do. They have restrictions with respect to disclosures. They have restrictions with respect to transparency. Disclosure. <coughs> they, have <coughs> they have restrictions with respect to filing details with the AMFI, with following the regulators, norms and everything. Uh, they cannot take a lot of risk. They are not allowed to invest in certain kind of stocks and all. They are not allowed to invest into certain kind of investments and all. It also depends on the mandate of the mutual fund. So there can be a large cap mutual fund which cannot invest in small cap penny stocks and all. So the mutual funds industry is very regulated. You are understanding why. Small amounts of money can be invested into mutual funds. It's the common public's money. But at the same time, when you're looking at the uh, uh, high net worth individuals and all investors and all there could be investors who are competent both in terms of understanding finance risk return implications etc as i was mentioning in the other class we've understood how sarda scam happened and it was the poor people's money that they robbed and it was not even brought to justice uh, uh, properly it was people who were daily wage earners money was taken away in sarda scam i have talked to people in person who have suffered because of this so I know I can feel for them. <clears throat> the government does not want that such kind of stuff happens to public at large. So hedge funds will have certain restrictions. How does a hedge fund work? So basically the problem was that in mutual funds and all, okay, I was there. In mutual funds and all, you may not get that opportunity to take a lot of risk, earn a lot of return. And there could be investors who are qualified in terms of net worth, in terms of being able to contribute that money, in terms of understanding the amount of risk. So those investors need an alternative to mutual fund because they have, let's say, 10 crore, 20, 20, 7, 8 crore, 1 million dollars to invest. So they want to take that exposure. They want to take that risk. We have an alternative for them. That is hedge funds. What is hedge fund going to do? Hedge fund has got nothing to do with hedge. It has got nothing to do with hedging. It is not that you're going to be hedging your risk and your risk is going to be very, very low and all of that. That is absolutely incorrect. 
So hedge fund has got nothing to do with hedging. Please understand that very clearly. Now, when you're looking at hedge fund strategies, the idea is that one hedge funds are not allowed to advertise. So it cannot go to public and say that, see, market is earning 15%. I will earn 25% and give it to you. So one, they cannot advertise so that common public does not get fooled. Second, it is only open to high net worth individuals. So you'll have to have a certain level of income, certain level of net worth in order to be allowed to invest in hedge funds. Third, the minimum investment size is going to be very huge. So until unless you have a lot of money, you will not be able to invest into hedge funds. Fourth, hedge funds are not allowed to advertise. I've already told you hedge funds, since they're not allowed to advertise, they also have less regulation. They have less restriction and <clears throat> they do not give disclosures and all. So mutual funds will tell me that, you know, this is my holding on a monthly basis. They'll disclose and everything, but a hedge fund is not going to be disclosing all of that. So what is their strategy? They will not tell you. They have less restriction. They cannot advertise, but and they have to have high net worth individuals investing in all, but they have less restriction in the sense you take risk, you do derivatives, you do short selling, you take loan and invest in the market, you do whatever you feel like. Because one, it is not the common public's money. And second, the people who have invested, they understand the risks of investing in hedge funds. The problem is not that the government does not want you to take risk, but the problem is that the government does not want you to be deceived. You know, with all the Instagram stock experts, that is what the government does not want. That is what we do not want to see. That is what we are working on. So you're understanding what is hedge fund? Now, the second important part about hedge fund is that one, the structure, I'll discuss separately how it is structured, the fees payment to the managers and all. And we already understand that the top quartile managers and the bottom quartile managers, the difference is very huge. So in hedge fund, selecting the managers and all is very important. Hedge funds, private equity and all. These are the basics we've already covered. Now, very important part is that hedge funds have a variety of strategies. And each, each hedge fund is different. Like in a commodity, a gold is going to behave very different from a corn or a rice or an oil. So within the commodities also, if you're looking at metals or an agro-based commodity or energy-based and all, it is very different. It is completely different the way they behave and the way they react. Right, oil will not uh, uh, react to seasonal or uh, weather factors and all. It may in terms of demand for oil increases. No, natural gas will be more impacted by the weather because of heating and all requirements. But anyways, you're getting the idea that com within commodities also is very different. In a private equity, within venture capital, it will be very different from different, uh, because venture capital itself is supposed to be some, you're bringing something new or fresh, new idea in different industries. So it's very different. Hedge fund is also totally different. So these are the different strategies that people use within a hedge fund. These are the different strategies that hedge funds use. So it is possible one hedge fund is focused only on this. Or one hedge fund is focused only on these strategies. It does not do any of the others. So even between the hedge funds, you would see there can be a lot of diversification because this hedge fund is going to behave very different from these hedge funds. So it depends on the kind of strategy you are uh, applying to the hedge funds. Tell me, are you understanding a basic idea of hedge funds? Now let me start discussing the strategies so that I can move forward with how it's structured and how it functions and everything. First, we need to know what a hedge fund does. So I've discussed that, you know, what are they allowed to do? What are they not allowed to do? Now, what do uh, what are the different strategies that the hedge funds deploy in order to earn profits, in order to earn returns? Let's see that. So I'm going to start in the reverse order because this is easier to understand. So let me build up first with this, then this, and then I'll come to this and this. <clears throat> so first one, when you're looking at hedge fund strategies, we broadly classified into event-driven, relative value, macro, and equity. On a very broad level, you can understand these hedge fund strategies are going to be using the equity shares. This hedge fund strategy is macro on a very macro level. So maybe investing in India or Brazil or India uh, or China or Russia. So we'll be looking at on a very, very macro on a very global level kind of thing. Oil prices, commodities. So how the things are moving in terms of economic perspective, not looking at which stock will do better. This company is good. This company is bad. This industry is bad. No, we're going to be looking at things on a more global macro level kind, right? There are certain strategies which are event driven. So based on, okay, merger is happening, this is going bankrupt. So there are certain events that are happening with the company. Based on that, there are certain strategies and there are certain relative value strategy. That means, let's say, for example, I will compare equity share of Tata Motors with option of Tata Motors. So there are two securities of the same company and how they are relative to each other, how they are valued and how I can make some money out of it. That is the objective of relative value. So two different securities and I will just try to see relatively which one is obviously we always do, you know, sasta buy, mehenga sell. Cheaper you buy, expensive you sell. So we'll look at something of that sort. So broadly, we've categorized all these strategies into these four categories. 
So we'll first start with the equity hedge fund strategies that is focused into using equity shares in all of companies. Now, how does it work? <clears throat> so when I'm looking at a market neutral strategy, the first one I'm discussing is market neutral strategy. So when you study a portfolio, you understand what is beta. So as I told you, you will have a lot of connections. Market neutral, say for example, if I uh, come up with a strategy where I am going to be, so I'm looking at market neutral. So uh, <clears throat> make sure you have a lot of space and you can just put arrows and keep marking. Or if you want, you can just do a So you can just write a 4A and write the stuff that I'll tell you. Anyways, don't write right now, just focus over here. So when I'm looking at a market neutral strategy, just scribble beside it. You know, when I'm looking at a market neutral strategy, we are going to be doing plus and minus of certain stocks or industries. Let's say, for example, I'm doing a plus and a minus of uh, um, I'll buy ICICI bank stock, I'll sell SBI stock because I think ICICI is going to do better than SBI. In this case, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to make sure that this beta and this beta is going to cancel off. So when I take exposure on stock, if you are not understanding beta, just think about beta as a measure of risk. So when I buy stock, I'm doing plus beta. Let's say this is plus 2.5 beta plus 1.2 beta, 1.8 beta, whatever. And here when I'm selling SBI stock, I'll sell it in such a quantity that it is negating each other and the entire net beta is becoming zero. So ultimately I'm market neutral. Let me explain it in another way. Say suppose if the market price, suppose bank goes up, the banking industry goes up. Let me show you how I'm market neutral. Ultimately I've purchased one banking stock and I've sold one banking stock. Now what happens is when a banking goes up, both ICICI and SBI are going to go up. Both ICICI and SBI are going to go up. But I am believing that ICICI is going to be outperforming SBI. So ICICI goes up. SBI also goes up. But SBI will go up by a lesser amount as compared to ICICI. This is my profit. This amount is my loss. Net net, I have a bigger profit, smaller loss. I have a net profit over here. Can you understand this? Because I've purchased ICI, so I'm making a profit. I've sold SBI. I did a short selling of SBI. So if, if basically what I've done is I've sold SBI at this price. Now, if the market goes up, I'll have to repurchase the stock at this level. I'll have to purchase the stock at this level and return the borrowed shares. So I sold at this. I purchased at this. I paid a higher amount. I got a lower amount. So this is my loss. But in ICIC, I purchased over here and I sold over here. There is a larger profit that I'm making into ICIC stock. Tell me, are you following this? So if the banking market goes up, if the market is going up at large, both the stocks are going up, but I'm making a profit. Now say, suppose there is a situation where banking goes down. Now ICICI is going to go down. SBI is also going to go down, but SBI will go down more. Because I'm telling you ICICI is a better counter than SBI. So ICICI is going to be outperforming SBI. So if the banking industry is going to go down, both the stocks will go down. But SBI will go down more than what ICICI will go down. So in this situation, this is going to be my loss. Obviously, whatever you purchase, if it increases, you profit. If it decreases, you make a loss. Whatever you short sell, if it increases, you make a loss. If it decreases, you make a profit. So this is going to be a profit. Because I sold SBI over here, now SBI's price went down quite a lot and I repurchased the stock at a lower price and returned back the shares, right? So this is my profit and profit is again more than loss. So net net I have a profit. So in this situation, I am market neutral. Whether banking industry goes up or banking stocks go down, I don't care. Irrespective of the situation, I'm going to get a profit. But that is only, so this is not a guaranteed strategy that all of you will jump and do it, start doing this strategy. The strategy is going to work if ICICI outperforms SBI. This profit is only under a situation, only if ICICI is going to be outperforming SBI.
is only if ICICI will outperform SBI because if ICICI increased less and SBI increased more, you make a loss. If SBI would have increased more, you short sold it and ICICI increases less, you'll make a loss. And over here as well, if ICICI falls more and SBI falls less, you will make a loss. This is going to happen. So it is not a guaranteed strategy. Guaranteed over that everybody will take millions and millions of loan and put all their money in ICICI plus SBI minus. Tell me, are you following this and become a karodpati? Does not work that way. Tell me, are you comfortable till here? Are you understanding what is a market neutral strategy? So do you also understand that why these kind of strategies or these hedge fund strategies could be quite diversifying or quite uncorrelated or quite low, uh, uh, could have quite a low correlation with equity market because equity market will be long on the markets. I'm either buying ICIC or I'm buying ICIC, then a Sun Pharma, then a, a, a Tata Motors or then a No Sale or a, a, a Balkrishna Tire or whatever. So I'm putting stocks together into a portfolio. I'm ultimately long on the market. If the market does well, I do well. If the market does bad, I do bad. But over here, what is happening? In this case, I'm being market neutral. I'm reducing my beta to zero. Beta is something you will learn to derive in portfolio. Right? So I'm trying to, by doing this, I trying to achieve zero beta portfolio. I'm trying to achieve a zero beta portfolio. Sorry, one second. I'll just keep needing to confirm I've covered everything. Tell me, are you following this? Also, do you understand that this investments could uh, this investment could be lever uh, leveraged? Because if, say, for example, I am buying thousand rupees worth of ICICI, I am let's say short selling eight hundred rupees of SBI. I just need to give two hundred rupees as my investment. How much of ICICI and how much of SBI you do will depend on relative risk because I want to make sure that I buy so much quantity of ICIC and so much quantity of SBI so that their risks are zero set off each other. If ICIC is very less risky, then I'll have to buy more ICICI so that the risk of ICIC is equal to SBI. I don't have to purchase and sell 100 rupees, 100 rupees. I'll have to do it in such proportion and such quantity that the risk is equal so that my and net total is a zero beta portfolio, a market neutral portfolio. Tell me, are you understanding this? Are you understanding a market, sorry, market neutral portfolio? So this is a market neutral hedge fund strategy. This is one of the strategies wherein you're using equity and these strategies, of course, short selling is not allowed by mutual funds and all. So you'll have to go for a hedge fund. And hedge funds also, see, understand hedge funds work at a very, very huge scale. When hedge funds are working at a very, very large scale as opera, uh, operating at very large scale, these people need to have, you know, prime brokers and all because how will you do short selling? Today, if I want to do short selling, I will not be able to. I will have to open a brokerage account and I will not be able to short sell like 1 lakh shares, 5 lakh shares. And these guys are not going to be trading for 100, 200 shares like we do. So they will need that kind of setup, those dealers, brokers, access, prime brokers, whatever you call them, they will need those kind of services and those kind of uh, assistance in the market. And every market may not be conducive. Maybe if India has a law that there is no short selling allowed. So there are different countries which will have different regulations. And when short selling is not allowed, you can use futures and all to replicate. So there are different ways you can do. Obviously, right now, we're just starting off with understanding what hedge funds are. Once you study derivatives, once you study equity, once you study portfolio, once you start putting together a lot of factors and a lot of things together, then you'll have a better understanding, which will happen. That is, that is how you start. Tell me, are you understanding this part? It's very interesting. Let's look at what is my next strategy. Fundamental long shot. Fundamental long shot is nothing but more of a continuation of this market neutral strategy. In market neutral strategy, we kind of try to get a zero beta portfolio. In a fundamental long shot, I would, actually I'm taking a lot of space, just to make it easy when you refer to notes. This was 4A. Okay. So when I'm looking at fundamental long shot, I can have a 130 by 30 
long shot position or 160 by 60 what does a 160 by 60 mean that means i will buy 160 dollars worth of shares and i will take a 60 worth of short position obviously you're buying something else you're going short something else ultimately you have a net net position of 100 investment but do you see there is a leverage over here as well because your investment is actually 160 but your contribution is only 160 uh, 100 the extra 60 you've gotten from short shorting another stock and there are there is an exposure of 220 if you notice because if this 60 goes up you make a loss if this 160 goes down you make a loss whatever i buy if that goes down i make a loss whatever i'm short selling if that goes up i'll make a loss tell me are you following this so over here in a way if you see you're gaining an exposure of 220 with only an investment of 100 but still net net you have a long position 160 60 you still have a net long position of 100 so this will be more conservative 130 30 a mutual fund will be 100 zero no short selling you get 100 you invest 100 simply so this is a fundamental long short position where your net net generally going to be long in position and why is it fundamental so one it is a long shot one aspect is and why do we call it fundamental long shot long shot part you understood but we identify which one to long and short based on fundamentals of the company which company will have higher growth which company will have lower growth so based on the fundamentals say for example i will do zomato plus and uh, jubilant food work minus because zomato is going to be catering to the entire food industry in india although i don't very very much favor zomato so don't take it as a recommendation at all but uh, i mean looking at the valuations and the entire space and everything but zomato i'll go long on zomato and short on jubilant food work because jubilant food work is only related to dominoes and one more what was that donut dunkin donuts and dominoes so i don't i would rather look at a company i think that will have more growth potential where it is covering huge variety across the country and jubilant food work is only having a couple of brands two or three brands to look into so that is my perspective that is my way of looking at it so fundamentally i see more growth with zomato and less growth with jubilant so i'll do a plus and a minus i'll get an exposure of 220 but net exposure is only 100 if you see because there is a short selling also i'm gaining an exposure of 220 when you're looking at it from a stock point of view but if you're looking at it from a uh, food industry point of view i'm gaining an exposure of 160 to food industry minus 60 on food industry net net i have an exposure to food industry is 100 stock specific exposure is 220 160 and 60. if you're looking at it from a stock specific perspective then my exposure is 220 but on an average i'm long one food industry stock short one food industry stock ultimately food industry does well both will increase but i am long on one and short on one but here in this case i have a net long position so if food industry grows well there is a profit there is a loss but if food industry does bad there is a loss there is a profit so loss is more i am net long on food industry so i am in a long position over here in market neutral i was not in a long position in market neutral i was in a neutral position I combine my position in such a way that I don't have any risk with respect to the market. Theoretically, beta and all are just calculations ultimately. Practically, you never know how the stocks behave and how the markets behave. These are calculations. Correlation, standard deviation is not a guarantee that if average return is this much and standard deviation is this much, then it will increase karega stock ka return and all. You cannot just guarantee that. We know the movements and all. These are basics which we are looking at. Um, uh, statistics and data and all next one is we have fundamental value so fundamental value is again very very simple not nothing much to add over here so when you're looking at fundamental value it is basically based on fundamental value growth small cap so we are going to look at the fundamentals of the company and identify the companies what is so different when you're looking at a fundamental value strategy versus a mutual fund normally a mutual fund will have to define it as a large cap uh, fund or a mid cap or a small cap nowadays we also have a multi-cap fund 
But here in fundamental value, there is more flexibility because hedge funds are not as regulated and they have more choices to execute things as compared to fund houses and all. And second, more important thing is fundamental value investments is allowed to do short selling also. So if I find fundamentally any stock is overvalued, I have the ability to short sell. In mutual funds, what can you do? If you have a stock which is undervalued, you can buy. But if a stock is un overvalued, you cannot do anything. In a mutual fund, if a stock is overvalued or undervalued, undervalued, you can purchase. So think about it. We all, we don't do any short selling. So we all investors, we can only identify undervalued stock. We all investors and mutual funds also can only buy stocks. So all the undervalued stock, there is so much of competition. Everybody is looking, tracking stocks, going through apps, looking at financials and they want to buy, find any undervalued stock and they want to buy. Nobody is looking at overvalued stock. There is less competition. There would be a lot of stocks and we people might be driving the stocks up and make them overvalued. And there is so much of less, there is so less competition when you're looking at the uh, overvalued counters, overvalued stocks and all. Right? So I'm just skipping one, I'll come back to it. When you're looking at the short bias fund, basically it is going to be net short. It wants to exploit It wants to exploit overvalued stock market. It wants to exploit the overvalued stock market. Are you understanding this? The stocks that are overvalued, you want to sell those because there is less competition. Undervalued, everybody is available to buy undervalued stocks and looking for that. But there are a lot of restrictions and only a few would be able to capitalize on overvalued stocks. So there is a short bias hedge fund. Now again, see, there will be this one will be relatively even more under. Uh, uh, um, it, this one will be providing an even even better amount of diversification benefit. This one will have probably a negative correlation with broader equity market because this is going uh, pura negative. This is going this is having a short bias. This will be more of a negative beta kind of a portfolio. This portfolio will be more of negative beta portfolio. Tell me, are you understanding this? <coughs> Interesting. Short bias. So fundamental value also you can go long or short but here so here it is a choice here it is whatever you find so I'm looking at counter I find an undervalued one buy overvalued sell you're looking at different fundamentals different kind of stocks and all and you have a lot of flexibility here but what is the difference short bias is particularly going to be negative beta it is going to be biased towards overvalued stocks so here there is no restriction that it is more of just overvalued here it could be under and over but here we are specifically trying to figure out overvalued stocks. So that is your short bias hedge fund, which is the fourth one which I skipped. Sector specific. sector specific is easy. Sector specific again, you understand. You're looking at sectors. Your uh, say, for example, during uh, there is a there is a hedge fund which focuses on biotech and pharma sector. So that sector is going to be looking at how COVID is going to be impacting. How is it going to be working? How the pharma industries are going to be faring? How diagnostics are going to do? Diagnostics will be doing probably better because they are going to be doing a lot of tests but the moment your home kits are out again the manufacturing companies get the ball in their court understand till the time you have to go to the diagnostic centers to get the tests and all done they are the ones who will be earning money out of the testing aspect but the moment you start manufacturing and selling home kits and all dv's laboratory and all is not doing it is the pharma companies who are manufacturing these home kits so do you see how within the pharma industry also different companies could be behaving in a different way also if you notice because of covid and lockdowns you would think that the hospitals are doing very well but again think about it during covid time i was going through one of the uh, lectures uh, uh, about within the pharma industry and all uh, so when you're looking at at covid so during the covid times people are not going out covid admissions into the hospitals are not having any operation theater related job ot is the one that charges maximum amount of money and if people are not going out they are falling less ill they're not exposed to pollution, accidents are not there. So do you think it is actually adding value to the hospital uh, in terms of in terms of revenue and all or is it actually reducing it? So again, figure out, think. It is not that because it is COVID, therefore everybody in pharma is earning. Pharma again has a manufacturing part, they again have a hospital chain, they have a diagnostic one, they have a research and development part. So within the pharma industry also you have different pockets. So when I'm looking at sector specific, so there could be fund which is focused on one particular sector and especially post COVID, I would want to, I probably am interested in investing into a biotech related and R&D related sector specific fund probably. 
or a sector specific fund that is into renewable energy you think that this is the next best thing and this particular sector is analyzing the battery manufacturing hydrogen powered car etc kind of stocks across the across the world and they are probably figuring out and investing in those kind of counters and stocks so i'm looking at sector specific and sector do not be the traditional sectors that we have been studying and uh, understanding in finance like banking fundamental etc healthcare biotech technology so specific sector so it could be very unique sector it could be a very different kind of sector and not the usual ones that we are used to discussing bank pharma fmcg and all now you have an ai based sector also so which companies are investing heavily into ai so when you're looking at metaverse do i see it positively somebody told me instagram is going to get chargeable or something monthly charges etc i don't know during live what do super chats during live sir so means what create, is super chats just like youtube they are when your creator is doing live videos so hmm. the audience can super chat and contribute to no, like that is chargeable yes Which I don't even know what super chat is. So, anyways, we'll get back to it later. So, feeling a little left out over here, but anyways, we'll get back. I'm happy being very okay with this part than your Instagram thing. Anyways, the next one is your macro strategy. So, macro is going to be easy to discuss. So, one we are looking at global economic trends. So, say suppose I'll, I'm just recalling one of these. Uh, Uh, interviews i was watching one of these discussions i was watching it was not an interview it was a discussion where ruchi sharma was there so he is one of the authors uh, he is the author of breakout nations so i'm not sure if you're going to be liking that book that much because i read it long back and it is covering the area of the time zone of 80s and 90s and all and uh, emerging market so it was covering you know the socio geo political and economic aspect of different countries and their relationship like us and russia always at loggerheads so why So yes, we know there is a Cold War, but why was there a Cold War? How much? I don't know how. I mean, the way we were taught World War One, World War Two was very pathetic, uh, uh, from what I can see. But you know, the way it is supposed to be taught, as in there were a lot of mind games. So if you're looking at World War One and World War Two, also there's a lot of Nash equilibrium. That this country did this, then they were expecting them to do this. These movies they make uh, movies on very small aspects of these World War One, World War Two, and all this image. Which one was this uh, Sherlock? Wala, just what's his name? Uska Sherlock guy. Benedict Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. Haan, so he did a movie, na imitation game. It was that. That one was imitation game. Ah, kya? So these people make movies on such small aspects of these world war and all, and these people earn tons and tons of money, and we people enjoy those movies. Nothing wrong with it. But the problem is that why were we not? Why aren't we able to look at it from that story point of view, from that Game of Thrones point of view? Why can't you analyze World War One and World War Two? Are you understanding what I'm saying? That is how you have to look at things. So you know everything that you're buying, everything that you're paying for, everything that you're seeing around you, you related to finance because everything is ultimately money, business, strategy, consumer, but psychology, all of these things. So World War One and Two is totally psychology. So how countries are reacting? How is China U.S. trade war going on? It was going on right now. Everything since COVID has become has gone to the. Oh. Uh, is not being covered to that that extent, but again, how different countries are behaving with China, especially when you're looking at Japan, Australia, and all. So, how are these things happening? Global macro strategy. I'm looking at how the global macro variables are changing. Which country is going to do better? Which country is not going to do better? So, I'm looking at all those factors, the relationship between the countries. I'm looking at the production, the natural resources, lithium ion becoming an important aspect. I'm looking at uh, 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 iron and steel prices. I'm looking at how EV is going to be changing the world. So when we're looking at all these factors, global macro strategies and all, we're looking at how the countries are going to do with respect to politics, with respect to economy, with respect to social. Everybody is looking at India and wants to invest in India because we people are the youngest population in the world, and we people are seeming to be the most consumer-driven economy. That we are going to be the next consumption economy, just the way US is more of a consumption. economy the consumption aspect is humongous over there when you're looking at it so when we're looking at all those factors so global macro so how is the economic inflation okay this country inflation is high i want to get the money out right now because when inflation will increase markets will fall interest rates will increase prices will go down i don't want to this country's currency is going to be appreciating or depreciating I want to invest in uh, uh, this uh, nation because the mineral prices are going to increase, and this country has a huge copper deposit. So let me invest my money into this country. So when you're looking at currency, you're looking at commodity, equity, inflation rate, fixed income. So you're looking at all the asset classes. You're looking at all the macroeconomic variables, and you're not looking at that I will buy this share and I will sell this share. This company's management is good and bad. That is not that is not the level at which we are thinking right now. 
we're thinking on a very very global macro economic level that is what we are looking at over here so when you're looking at macro uh, uh, macro strategies and all it is more about the broader asset classes and more about the countries maybe i want to take my money out of japan and invest into let's say uh, uh, vietnam i'm very bullish on the apparel industry textile industry and i think bangladesh is going to be doing very well let me put my money into bangladesh so commodity currency economy everything that i'm looking at in terms of a very very macro level in fact the managed futures also at times can get categorized under macro uh, strategy because again so you can you can you can classify cta's commodity trading advisors that we were discussing in commodities also under macro macro global strategy because commodities when you're looking at oil prices mineral prices and all they are going to be more or less, they are more of global commodities it's not atta dal chawal we're not talking about agro based and all but when you're looking at oil and natural gas and uh, gold and all they're more of global commodities and their prices because it's very, it's it's more of an integrated world today because if there is a huge price difference bet, uh, uh, between gold in india and gold in a country x and it is easy to transport gold of course custom duty and everything is there but paring that the prices should be similar otherwise people can arbitrage if it is cheaper from somewhere else i will buy start buying gold from that country and start selling in india tell me are you following this this is your macro strategies and of course in macro also you can do your long shot and all because hedge funds have all the liberty to do whatever they want on a broader level tell me are you understanding till here got it